Welcome to episode 70 of the AAEM RSA Resident and Student Podcast Series, a production of the American Academy of Emergency Medicine Resident and Student Association. This episode is a recording of a live webinar that took place on June 29, 2020. In this episode, Joshua Sawyer, a medical student at the Alabama College of Osteopathic Medicine and the AAM RSA Medical Student Council Southern Regional Representative, interviews Dr. Christine Babcock, Program Director of the University of Chicago, Dr. Snow, Program Director for the Loyola Emergency Medicine Residency Program, Dr. Charles Curie, Residency Program Director at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and Dr. Melissa Platt, Program Director at the University of Louisville Department of Emergency Medicine. Today, Program Directors discuss applying EM during COVID-19. Program Directors here tonight to discuss some of the goings-on with applying to emergency medicine residency uh, during this uh, pretty unprecedented year. Um, so if you all don't mind, if you wouldn't uh, introduce yourselves and uh, tell us a little bit about your, where you're coming from and uh, maybe something that you like to do to keep yourself sane during all the COVID madness. Dr. Platt, if you want to start. Sure, I'll start. Uh, my name is Melissa Platt. I am the program director for the last six years at the University of Louisville. I'm also a professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine. I sort of uh, enjoy... Uh, sort of women's health, um, educational topics, um, and things that keep me sane um, are my 15-year-old, believe it or not, son does keep me sane, and gardening um, is a pretty um, therapeutic for the COVID um, isolation that we've all undergone. Hi, everybody. I'll go next. Uh, my name is Chrissy Babcock. I'm the program director at the University of Chicago. Um, I guess this is my ninth year, which is crazy because the time goes really, really fast. Well, I have a one-year-old, so that keeps me on my toes. I'm not sure that actually keeps me sane, but it keeps me on my toes. And my four-year-old dog is my best friend. She may try to make an appearance at some point. She likes to be on the Zoom calls. Thanks for this opportunity. Excited to meet with you guys and talk to y'all. I guess I'll go. I'm Charles Corey. I'm the program director at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And um, let me think here. What, what have I been doing to keep myself sane? Uh, the first few weeks of... The COVID madness back in March, I like to eat a lot of junk food and put on some weight. And uh, the past couple of months, I've actually been running and trying to get my life right because um, I think we all got a little crazy at the beginning of COVID. So uh, running and uh, I watch a lot of Netflix lately because you can't go out that often anymore. So that's what I do. All right. I guess I'll go next. Uh, I'm David Snow. I've been the PD for the job title says two years, but we've only had one year of having residents because we're a newer program. So, um, but still, I'm going with it. Two years of being a PD at Loyola, uh, just outside of uh, the city of Chicago in Maywood. Um, I have on the on the kids theme. I have three kids. I have a four year old and one and a half year old twins. That, as it stands right now, all are calm. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I guess to keep saying. I don't think that's the right way to say it, but I basically run and train for marathons that don't happen. So I'm just on this cycle right now where I train for things that don't actually happen. So, so I don't know if I call it, it staying sane, but it certainly keeps me occupied. Thank you all again uh, for taking time out of your uh, busy schedules to, uh, um, to be here. I know Dr. Corey was saying he's about to go into a shift, and I'm sure you all are going and coming from shifts to, to help us out. Uh, we certainly appreciate benefiting from your uh, knowledge and wisdom. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of jump into it uh, and address your programs. Uh, what methods or strategies is your program uh, employing to get exposure to applicants and, and also get a, applicants exposure to you? Um, so basically, how should students get to know you? And uh, I guess whoever feels led to jump in, you're welcome. And if there's anything I don't ask or you want to add, please feel free to to, to add it. We're here. <laughs> this is sort of the first um, one that we're, we're just trying to get out as, as virtual as possible um, to make contact with students because all of us um, have been impacted, including yourself, with not being able to do away rotations and getting to know you guys in person. So here we are, um, and we'll probably do uh, more as they come forward, both for the regional as well as national uh, meetings updating the website, um, putting out some videos just so that you guys can have an opportunity to get to know us. Um, we'll be putting stuff out there um, via the web and uh, by social media. 
Yeah, I just want to echo. So um, don't feel like you guys are behind on anything. We're all just starting this and trying to figure this out. And we're all in this together, right? This is going to be uh, strange, but hopefully kind of fun and exciting year for everybody doing this virtually. And I think we're all trying to find out how do we make ourselves accessible to you? How do we help you understand our programs? How do we get to know you? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, we want each of you to match the program you want to be at, right? That's our goal. Um, so we're, I mean, I can tell you, Chicago, we're still trying to sort this out. We just welcomed our new interns um, and got, I don't want to say got rid of our threes, but they're on their way out. Um, they're wonderful. And so now we're starting to think about how do we actually go about this next year? So virtual events, virtual residency fairs, um, we're, we have a lot of work to do on our website still, um, getting access for you guys to be able to learn as much as you can about the programs. And I think each program is going to do their best and we may all evolve at different times throughout this, depending on sort of what's going on at, at our home shops, but we're here for you guys. And honestly, if you have advice for us as residency program directors on how we can be best accessible to you, we're happy to learn from you guys too during the session. Yeah. I think the biggest, uh, mistake we all could make would be to assume that we know what's going on because this is our first pandemic too and i think i can i mean i see everyone's head kind of furiously nodding that, that we're going to do the best we can and that we're going to try to give as much exposure to our programs and we're going to try to get to know as many of you as we can also but it is kind of tough um i think we're gonna we're gonna be uh looking for more humanistic qualities and applications than we ever have before we're going to be reading letters a little more carefully and really trying to get to know applicants through letters. And uh, that's one way we're starting. And um, I mean, I'm, I echo what a lot of these folks are already saying that uh, we've got a lot of work to do on our websites. We've got a lot of work to do on Twitter and things like that. But um, it's funny as we're doing all of this, we're also orienting brand new interns and we just finished graduating some residents. So I'm sure everyone is trying to catch their breath a little bit also. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, like such a such a crazy time to think through how these next few months can flow because they cannot flow the same way that they have done in previous years. You know, I feel that I feel that everyone, myself included, with with my program leadership, are going to be doing all the things that everyone else is doing with websites and, and sessions like these. And I know ASAP is is virtual this year, so so that piece goes goes virtual too. There's there's just so many ways where it was very easy to get a large collective of people together to ask questions and do all that kind of thing that that goes away and then we revert back to word of mouth and websites but even that is going to be so so challenging this year for for applicants and then you know on the flip side for us you know with with uh with the application system opening up to us later in the year it just becomes that wee bit more challenging to stay true to the things that we've done in years past you know and my last job is apd at a program in chicago and i've for two years working through it at loyola we committed to you know if you send us an application we will review it we have a rubric that we score people off based on our mission statement but now we have essentially seven or eight days to get through however many what is it 13 1400 of those so i've just committed to i won't see my family for that period of time and and we'll work through that as it comes but you know, it's like we we don't want to shortchange anyone, and we already know that you're being shortchanged on the in-person experiences. So, I mean, I couldn't echo what Dr. Babcock says any more than if you have advice for us, we we welcome it because we really are trying to work through this to do right by by everyone that's applying. And I know everybody mentioned uh, you know virtual uh, virtual things. I do want to plug real quick that uh, we are going to set up a um uh, a page on on the site um in some form uh to kind of house uh programs virtual content um kind of to make it a little more uh, i guess accessible for uh applicants that way they can go to one one stop shop kind of a thing uh to look at everything so just everybody keep that in mind um you mentioned the kind of uh this compressed time frame that is going to result uh this application season um what strategies are your programs employing to uh deal with that uh to to accomplish getting through those applicants uh in, a, in some sort of a meaningful way yeah I, I'll, I'll jump on that one first i mean it's it's really it's kind of a for us it's a all hands on deck you know we've known for a wee while now we've got a little bit of time to 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 get people up to speed on how we work through the application system 
Um, I'm probably going to have to find some way to to uh, bribe them and and get them on board. I say that jokingly. I mean, it's just because it's it's hard work going through the applications. You know, it's people's lives distilled down in a few pages and letters and grades and all that. And it's you know, if you if you take a snapshot in one of those, then you miss someone's qualities within that. You know, it becomes becomes really hard to sort people out sometimes. So it it, it takes time, and and to do it right takes takes time and effort and a desire to really commit to what your residence is driving towards. So for us, instead of it being, you know, just a few select people, it's going to be a lot more people and the potential of having residents involved in that because they're, they're reaching out to me now to say, how can they get involved to help with that? If they're looking towards that as something they're interested in their career. So it's, you know, it's, we can't change what's before us much like it is for, for you guys too. It's, the time is the time that we have and you know we stay true to what our ultimate goal of, of all of this is which exactly what we stated it's to get you guys the residency that you want so so that's our approach is it's going to be long hours with with more people but staying true to, to what we initially put in place yeah I, I would agree we have a very good educational team and we really are it's all hands on deck um, from our standpoint to get um, good quality applicants um, to review them, to not shortchange you. That is our pledge to you. I know that all four of us uh, will make that um, extra effort because we know this is sort of, you know, uncharted territories. We've all not, uh, never done this before this way. Um, so, you know, our educational teams are here to help you and serve you uh, and make sure that you are not overlooked in this uh, new application cycle. Yeah, I think the only thing I can add to that, we're actively in the last week trying to actually nail down what interview days we will actually put on the calendar and put on our website. And the only thing we're considering is we may push our dates back. We generally don't interview past the first of the year because it's hard to get in out of Chicago in the winter sometimes. So, um, but we may end up interviewing into January. That's the only real change. Otherwise, we plan on having a very similar interview day to all the years past. Um, we're just trying to figure out how to cover some of the things that we normally do in person via a live Zoom type session. So, um, you mentioned the uh, residents, uh, you know, contacting you wanting to get involved. Uh, we had actually a question in the in the chat that was uh, wondering what uh, what sort of role they would play this year and how that would compare to a traditional year. Um, I know they're typically involved in in selection on their their input is involved in, in some way. Uh, how will that change this year, or if at all? Um, one of the things we're trying to figure out, and I'm and I'm uh, leaning on our institution a little bit as much as I am at, with other programs, is to figure out how we're going to market ourselves as an institution, as a university. And um, I think some of us are waiting on that specifically. Like uh, UAB is a huge place, and if they're going to create videos about UAB and about our residents, um, then that that takes a lot of the work out of this, honestly, so that you get to know our, our hospital and our, our, our institution. And then from there, we would like to, to get our residents out there, maybe to do some of these Zoom calls, to do some uh, virtual happy hours, and uh, you can get to know the program itself specifically. So I, I guess the short answer to that is I, I would I would hope that our institutions will help us market the institution itself and that our residents will help us market our programs and uh, we're planning on doing some social happy hours we're gonna get our chiefs involved and the nice thing is there's usually a few residents who really like the social aspect even of zoom and uh, they should be able to step up and answer questions and stuff and that's what we want we want we want our you guys to be honest with our residents and our residents to be honest with you and to tell you, you know, the strengths and the areas for improvement. And so we're going to try to go that way. Yeah, I know I can speak. Uh, recently I've had, uh, uh, some interactions with, uh, on the, on the military side, I'm in the Navy and, uh, they've been getting us involved. It's a little different situation, but they've been getting us involved with their uh, residency didactics. And that's been a huge, uh, asset for me as an applicant just seeing how things play out what the culture's like um, even even in a virtual way um, to the question of rotations um, I know this has been a, a huge source of stress in, in my classmates and I, and I imagine across the country um, with rotations being canceled etc is your program offering 
virtual rotations, in-person rotations, both? And do you have any advice for applicants that are coming from uh, orphan programs uh, that typically rely more heavily on the opportunity to, to show up and, and prove themselves in person? So I can speak, we, um, we're, our institution is not allowing um, any visiting rotations across the board in all specialties. So unfortunately we are not able to offer an in-person rotation. Um, in addition, we are not able to really put together a virtual rotation at this point. So um, we won't be able to have anyone come in in a formal capacity. Uh, we are looking at what some other programs are doing, potentially having some sort of Q&A type sessions likely led by the residents um, so people can kind of familiarize themselves with the program leading up to interview season. Um, but we're still trying to work that out. I will say, you know, be, all four of us are very involved in CORD, which is the Residency Director Association. And, and it's been pretty clear that the recommendation is that students from orphan medical school should get the priority for the rotations that are available. Um, and I think most of us are committed to that. I can tell you, we've told our students at the University of Chicago, because they have a home rotation, that we, we really don't want them even thinking about doing an away rotation so they could save those spots for people that don't have a home opportunity. Yeah, and the same, same with Loyola in that last part and that our um, fourth year medical students are not allowed to go away and do an away because we have an EM program. We do have spots available, but it's, you know, that they just seem very limited and that, you know, everyone's just kind of working within the, the, the times that they have and it seems like we get notification later on that we have a spot available, but we're maintaining, you know, a list of people that have applied to us. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's hard and it puts, I, you know, there's so many ways to spin this question out. You know, you, you think of the people that, you know, and, and, and just to say too, we're only allowing people that are from orphan programs to, to take those spots too. It's just, I think about where we've tried, like my advice to people, everyone, I feel like their advice to people has been, you know, get more than one slow. It's the best way to kind of showcase yourself and, and, and show that you've done well at your home institution and in a way one classically. And now we're, I feel like I'm going to get applications where the, there are no slows. And in years past, that was, that was an issue. You know, that was, well, they didn't put the, they didn't get that figured out. And, and I don't have a fair way to, to evaluate them across the board with, with other applicants. And, and that's not fair this year. And, and I don't yet know how that will play out in the scoring rubric that we have, but it can be in a way that, you know, disadvantages that student in any way. It's just, it's just an outrageous time. And then if you do get in a way, the pressure is so much on you to, to perform on that away because it's that sole away where so much is hinging um, off of that slow, which is what we've said for years past is the single most important part of your application. So there, like if you add all of that up, it's, it's just an outrageous amount of stress to put on fourth year students that are already in this tremendously stressful time in their medical career. So, so if if I interpreted the question correctly, which I'm notoriously known for not doing, the end of that was that you know advice for for students on those aways. I don't know. It's, this this comes across as as ridiculous in a way, but I mean it as sincerely as I can. But don't put any more pressure on yourself than is already there. You know, just what we want on on people that are before us, whether it's people within our medical schools that are rotating or away rotators, is people that just enjoy being there. They enjoy being there. They want to learn. They want to see patients. If we try to teach them something, they respond to it. Whether they agree with it or not is, is neither here nor there. But, you know, they're receptive. We're receptive to them. It's just don't come in thinking that you have to run an ED, which I think is what happens sometimes when students put themselves under pressure. They're like, I need to manage a STEMI, a stroke, and a septic intubation all at the same time. It's like, no, not at all. Like, you're, you're a fourth-year medical student, and you're there to learn, and we're there to teach you. Just have fun with it when you're there as much as you can within the confines of this, you know, ridiculous season. I'm glad you brought up the, uh, the question of the slow. Um, and, and you said y'all, y'all are all pretty involved with CORD. Uh, given the, the guidance from CORD and ask him about uh, the alternate slow riders and um, now the publication of the uh, O slow or the, uh, for folks who are not coming from an EM background, um, how is that going to change the way you look at maybe narrative letters or other letters of evaluation? Um, that may be a difficult question you may not know yet, um, but how do you anticipate that it'll, it'll alter your reception of those? 
I, I can jump in here just because we've been reading a lot about the Oslos and we're planning on using them for, for things like ultrasound rotations and tox rotations. What I would, what I would, I, I want to, I want to spend this for students so that you guys get something out of this, this conversation right here. What I would, what I would tell you to do is find people to write your letters who not only have gotten to know you pretty well, but also can write a strong letter of recommendation for you. And it doesn't matter to me whether it's a slow or an Oslo or an Isla or whatever it is, or just a regular red letter of recommendation. We are going to read them, uh, even the non-slows, even more carefully this year. And the scoring is going to be different this year. We haven't figured out how exactly, but, but, but it will be. And my advice would be find people who can write you strong letters of recommendation. And when you ask somebody for a letter, give them an out so that you have an excellent letter of recommendation. You should ask, you know, would, would you feel comfortable writing a strong letter of recommendation for me? If not, that's totally fine. I understand you're busy. And if they still enthusiastically say, I would love to tell me where it goes, what to do, then that's how you know you've got a good letter. If they seem a little hesitant or maybe a little, you know, like, I don't, yeah, I, I could probably do that then that's where I would back off because it is going to be important that your letters are outstanding this year. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Um, it used to sort of be about quantity um, and now it's really going to focus on the quality of your uh, letters of recommendation, regardless of where they come from. Um, and, and just to put the students' minds at ease, the program directors you know, sort of across the nation have been talking about this and, and we're preparing ourselves to sort of change our, our eyes and to read these letters of recommendation with a different set of eyes, a, a new sort of criteria. And that's across the board for emergency medicine. So don't think that somehow you're being um, isolated or, or less than this is we're really applying this across all residencies, you know, the majority of residency programs are not taking away uh, rotators um, that you again will be in the majority and not the minority if you, if you don't or can't uh, complete an away rotation. Our institution has told their med our medical students that they can't do away rotations. Um, and that you're going to find is very common um, across the nation. So in terms of trying to, um, I know Dr. Corey kind of touched on this, uh, and you may not know how you're going to um, effectively change your evaluation so that you can subjectively and objectively evaluate candidates differently this year. What part, the other parts of the application, like the personal statement and um, step scores, how is that going to factor in differently this year, if at all, to you? So I just, I think most of us, um, this whole how we review applications is like this scary black box mystery to, to students and I totally get that. Um, I'll be, I'll tell you guys, we put a lot, a lot of time into reading your entire applications. I mean, we don't, at UChicago, we don't really filter. We look at them all. Um, so, so you want to present your best self, right? And every, each one of you guys has your own strengths and your own areas for improvement. And you really want to highlight your strengths in your application, right? So if you were... If you did a ton of community service and that's your jam and that's what you want to do as you move forward, show that in your application, right? If you wanted, if you like have done a ton of research and that's your thing, let your application speak to that. We're going to change our scoring rubric this year. We don't really know how. Um, we're going to put less weight on step scores because I understand that a lot of you guys are in a situation that you may not be able to take step two in a timely manner. And it's not, that's no fault of yours, right? That's just the circumstance we're in right now. Um, so for the parts you can control, uh, make them the best you that you can be and know that we actually truly read through all of these things. So what you write in your sort of CV portion and your memory, you know, your experiences that you talk about, write, like spend time writing those up, like spend time writing what, what's important to you, spend time on your personal statement, your letters, you know, find the right letters, write letters or letter writers or write you a strong letter. You obviously can't see them, but you'll be able to tell to what Dr. Corey was saying. Like if you find the right person that matches with you, um, and, you know, you guys are all unique and different and we're all looking for different things in our programs. And we can find that by looking through your applications. We don't put a lot of weight on numbers anymore. At least not, I don't at UChicago. It's more the holistic view of who you are. Which is what your personal statement's a great place um, to highlight who you are um, as an individual, as a physician, and what sort of sets you apart um, from everybody else. Um, 
you have a great opportunity in your personal statement to really highlight your strengths um, and, and let us know who you are as a person. And I'm hoping as well that, you know, I feel like, you know, reviewing however many four digit personal statements last year and years past, you know, it's a lot of the personal statement in years past has been why I chose emergency medicine. You know, like those kind of things, like when you chose emergency medicine, and that's fine. But like, I have no issue with that. But I feel like now more than ever, we need these these pieces that we're taking the time to review to reflect you. So exactly what was said before me, I'll just echo again. You know, really think about about putting down on paper what makes you you, what you want to do with your time, what you want from from a residency program. You know, like really focus on that. Really make it personal from that standpoint to really give us that that way of getting to know you because some of the best slows were written by people that during that rotation got to know you and started to kind of put together what made you tick and you know what areas that they, they saw that you wanted to to work in and you know in residency and in the future and that kind of added to what was in the dean's letter the mspe if, if people within them that spoke to that too, but sometimes you get files where the, the slows and the MSPE don't really speak to that. So that's where that, that, that personal statement is really, you know, a, that, that best way to, to figure out who you are and what you're about, you know, and, and not that that should become make or break or anything like that. It's just, you know, we, we read these things, you know, we, we essentially read these documents cover to cover. I don't think, I saw some questions on the chat there about what else can we do to Help you guys get to know us in the file. I don't know what else you can do. I mean, you're essentially distilling down your life into into all these different components of 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 the application cycle. But that that personal statement might be one thing where we just sort of change the approach to that. Yeah, I I really uh, feel for y'all in the sense of uh, how difficult it must be to take uh, essentially unknown quantities and try to make uh, make them known and make a decision. Um, is there the reading through the Oslo, it seems like it does a pretty good job of walking through um, and walking individuals who may not be familiar with what y'all are looking for specifically uh, in terms of a, an applicant and, uh, and making a, a good letter that y'all can interpret. Is there anything that you would differ from uh, after reading that uh, or anything you would add that people should be, um, I guess, trying to uh, model in their letters? When you when you say letters, are you are you talking about like the letters of recommendation, just to make sure? Uh, yes, sir. So yeah, uh, the uh, if people are unable to get an O slow or get somebody to write it in that format, and somebody's writing a narrative letter, um, is there anything that you would uh, recommend that people be trying to get in those letters? Yeah, no, it's I'm I'm, I'm glad I asked to clarify that. You know, just building on what Dr. Curry said, you know, it's. When, you know, the question of whether to, you know, the question of asking someone if they can write a good letter is not about whether, you know, they like you or not, you know, it's, it's about whether they know you well enough to write a letter that gives the person reading it that, that, that personal slant to who you are, right? It's just that, it's like another piece of, or pieces of data about who you are as a person and what you're going to bring to a residency program. So, and that doesn't mean at all if, 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 if there are students out there that don't have those people that they're like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm out of luck. Um, but what it means is maybe the approach for, for these letters is that you offer up some of the, you know, some more information for the letter writers. You know, if, if you get someone you know that, you know, they, they've, you've worked with them, then, then go all in, you know, provide them with, with a lot of information, whether they ask for it or not about, who you are, what you want uh, out of residency, what you may want to do with your career, right? That ridiculous question that I've been guilty of asking of during, during interviews, knowing full well that you just figured out that you wanted to do emergency medicine. But it's one of those things, the more you know about who you are and what the makeup is and what you want to do with the next steps, the easier it is for people to write these things about you. And if you don't know those things, that's totally fine. But, but don't be afraid to just offer up volumes of information for people that might write letters it just it's so many of those non-slow letters in the past have been you know like i could pick one out of a file and just drop them into the next one and do that you know 
800, 900 times and not really know which file I was in because a lot of those non-slow letters, they read very similar. And we read them, but because they read very similar, it's really hard to know what the value is of them. So, you know, if anything, for the past several years, maybe our approach to mentoring for those letters is really try and take that approach to a slow, which is, you know, tell it like it is, you know, tell the, tell the, the person that's reading it just who I am and what I'm about, all the things that I feel like I might have said 10 or 12 times so far, you know, just really add that, that unique aspect about, about you as, a, as an applicant. Yeah, I like the, I like the uh, idea of using the personal statement more to tell about yourself than about why you're doing what you're doing. Because we, we all get, get the idea. I mean, we all went into emergency medicine for one of four or five reasons, and everyone's got that, that, that combination of things to their own liking. But uh, it is nice to read a personal statement. If, if that's the first thing I open in your application, it's nice to get to know you a little bit from it. So you can start maybe a little bit about where, where you're from, what, how you got into this and that, but then also talk more about yourself, what, what you're into, maybe the aspects of emergency medicine you love and not just about how you got into it. To, whether it's the, the social determinants of health or um, – I, I, most of the time, I think people tell a story. They say, I was watching this happen in trauma, and then this is how the doctor did and whatever. You can go on for two paragraphs about that, but I'm not really going to get to know much about you if you're telling me a story of something that happened in the ER. So, so use this opportunity to, to, to get yourself known to a program director, because I, I guarantee you we're going to be looking at personal statements very closely this year and trying to get to know you more through your personal statement. Yeah, I think it just takes um, a little bit more thought this year about who you ask for your letters of recommendation. Really take a, uh, some time and think about who would be a good person to write a letter of recommendation for you. If that person is not used to writing letters of recommendation, you can give them, you know, the, the O uh, slow that's out there, it's like a parameter, an outline, um, some direction or some guidance um, for this letter of recommendation. Because in reality, you have very little control and you won't know what they write about you in this uh, letter of recommendation. So make sure you put some thought into who you ask um, for the Oslo or um, if it's just going to be a letter of recommendation. And then they may need some guidance and they will be more than willing um, to take advice from you because this is new for everybody. They may say, hey, this is a new interview season um, for everyone. These letters of recommendation may take on um, extra weight. Tell them that um, and sort of set that expectation for that letter of recommendation because they may need some guidance because they're not used to writing um, the volume and the amount um, uh, of letters that all four of us are used to writing. So along those lines, we had a, a good question in the chat. If, uh, if I'm a, an applicant that um, is looking for a letter and I have, uh, let's say, um, an ER doc that I worked with prior to medical school who's willing to write a letter uh, versus maybe uh, somebody I did a you know family medicine rotation with. Um, would you all prefer to see uh, the EM doc letter in that scenario even though they didn't work with me as a medical student or would you prefer to see um, somebody who had worked with uh, the student clinically uh, as a as a medical student? It's it's tough right it's tough because to think through then that the, the answer that we come to is is what's going to be applied to every situation as it's similar to that is, is is a tough one for my simple brain to work through i feel like the clinical aspect is what the slow offered um so that's that that's obviously very useful but i feel like the you know these N slows, these O slows, I don't know how many versions of these that are going to be out there, but I feel like they're all geared towards having a standardized approach to, to letters to, to maybe move away from these, these generic letters that we've read in the past. I think, I think it honestly, like, put it down to which one do you think is going to write the letter that, that knows you the best, honestly? It, just go from there, you know? Like, I think if you start to delineate it out too much, it's just gonna, 
you're going to get probably 50 different answers if you ask 50 different people, for, you know, so it's, if, if you just go off of that, if they can write a letter that, that is the best reflection of you with, with the best information that, that, that's available for you, then, then go with that. And I don't think that you'll go wrong off of that, honestly. Yeah, I, um, this, this may sound kind of strange, and I'm, I'm taking a little bit of a shot here, but if, if you have really high board scores and like the, the numbers on your, your application are stellar, probably what you need in your letter is somebody attesting to how wonderful of a person you are. And just that you're pretty normal, that you're easy to get along with. If you've struggled with boards in the past, if you have some standardized testing problems, if somebody is wondering whether you have like the scholastic aptitude to get through this, then you probably want somebody saying, this is a real deal doctor. I see them as an emergency physician. So maybe use the letter of recommendation to speak to a potential weakness and have that person kind of hit it out of the park there. That, that's how, that's because a lot of times when I read these, I'm thinking to myself, sure, they've got a 270 on, on step, but are they easy to talk to? Is it somebody who you'd be miserable sitting next to at three in the morning in the emergency department? And for a letter to come through and be like, this person is really down to earth and humble, um, that, that's very reassuring. So, so look at it that way too. Yeah, I agree. This one, this question's tough because it, it's a very, there's no generalizable answer for this, right? I mean, it's, it's who's, you guys are each unique and different and it's who can actually help you shine to be the you that you are. Um, and so, I, I mean, I would, for those of you who have um, emergency medicine programs at your institutions, I would talk to your clerkship directors, your deans and your, you know, residency leadership there. For those of you that don't, I mean, there's plenty of us that are willing to help you individually um, if you are from an orphan medical school and don't have a lot of uh, mentorship. Um, but I really think this is one where you need to like actually look at your entire complete application and, and figure out what will augment this um, and make me really stand out for who I am. We will read them though, no matter where they come from, that I promise. Yeah, it does seem a typical, uh, you know, letter writing advice, just picking the same, you know, the person who knows you best, who can kind of get that across um, uh, in a, effectively in a, in a piece of writing. Um, moving on to the, uh, the question of interviews. Uh, there was a, a recent uh, joint position statement um, recommending uh, uh, about, I think it was, let me double check. Yeah, uh, 12 interviews with an absolute max of 17. Um, what are y'all's thoughts on that? And do you think that uh, students should be uh, applying to more programs? I know that's always a touchy subject and, and often the programs have a different opinion than the student or applicant that's trying to um, make their dreams come true. But uh, what are y'all's thoughts on that and why or why not? Yeah, I mean, this, this is probably one of the hardest ones that any of us have had to work through this year. I mean, it's, I think the hardest thing for, for students to hear is that limits might be set um, on, on things that are important to them for that most important part of their medical training, right? It's just, that's an immensely challenging thing to work through. But, but what we want to, the goal of it, if I, I feel like the, the first thing is always thinking through like, what's the goal of, of any position, any statement, any line of communication. And the goal is to make sure that, that when the PD and leadership team sit down to review applications, that that application pile is from people that want to be at the residency. And I think that the reason that that has come to be is, is in years past, so many people have just looked at maybe at geographic areas or, you know, they're based on the competitiveness of their application based on who their mentors are and, and you know, sent off quite a few applications, maybe ones that if they'd had time, which is a very hard thing to find at that time, maybe they wouldn't, would not have sent their application to that program. And then when the program extends them an interview, they don't take it. And then we're scrambling to fill that spot. And, and it's, neither side is right and neither side is wrong. Um, and again, I, I have concerns about any kind of, you know, cookie cutter standardized approach to any of this, but I feel like if we stay within the confines of that, the data shows that if you, if you complete that number of interviews, your, your, your chance of ranking is, you know, at a percentage that's very suitable. And what we want to avoid is the people that are not in that position to say, well, I'm only going to take 12 to 17. I'm actually going to be glad if I get five. 
that they are not sitting there in November, December, January saying, I don't have any. And it's, it's really hard to work through that, but I don't see how we won't find ourselves if there are no limits in a situation where that's absolutely going to happen to way more people this year because there's uncertainty. There's not the same things that are in applications as has been in years past, which is what we said was the most important thing. You know, the things about the cost of travel and all that kind of thing, I don't think that really adds to it, but it must in some way. But I don't feel that people would say, well, I'm going to interview because there's no cost. Like there's a time cost to sitting on Zoom with me for a day. You know what I mean? And you're not getting that time back anytime soon. So, you know, I, I just feel like it's the uncertainty about this that's going to make people push a lot more. And I, and I think, you know, the goal of this is to make sure everyone gets, gets a chance to sit at the table and, and talk. You mentioned the, um, the kind of the ideal scenario of interviewing a pool of applicants who are, you know, truly want to be at your program and are interested in being there. Um, how, if I'm a student in this uh, application cycle, how can I communicate that interest to y'all, um, you know, prior and during to the application? Uh, what, what ways can I uh, make that known to you? I mean, you can always email, right? You can always email us saying, hey, I'm really interested in your program. If you do that, a couple of words of caution. One, make sure you're not copying and pasting those emails because we can tell on the backside, especially when I get an email saying, Dr. Babcock, I'm so excited to think about coming to Loyola. I'm like, hey, David, let me just forward you this email, right? Because we're in the same town. Um, so make sure you're not cut cutting and pasting. I will read all of those emails. I will read them in closer detail if you're providing compelling reasons why you personally want to come to or interview or learn more about my program and you actually have some specifics, right? Um, don't necessarily expect that you're going to get a response to those emails, right? Because we're trying to manage all of this volume and, and we may not be able to actually have a correspondence with you, but that will put you on. I save all those emails I get. I put them in a folder and when we're looking through files, sometimes I'm like, oh, that name's familiar and I'll go back and I'll read that email or I might relook at that in that folder at people that express interest prior to sending out invites. So I think that's something you can do. I would pay attention. Um, I think some programs may be offering ways that, you know, I know that like, I'm not trying to promote any programs here, but I know for Highland is offering like a monthly session with their residents for people that are interested in the program to learn about things. So programs, as we move into this next academic year, um, may start doing that kind of stuff. So if there's a program that's on your radar that you think you want to know about, if they do something like that, jump on, jump on the Zoom call, right? I mean, um, that's really information for you guys. But again, I think that like expressing your interest via email is probably the only thing you're gonna be able to do this year because you can't really travel, right? And we, we can't have any visitors on campus at all. So we, I can't even actually meet with you if you're in town. Um, so we're limited by what we can do with how things evolve with COVID, but that would be my only advice for right now. How do you, uh, how do you all anticipate that uh, online interviewing is going to um, change how you interact with applicants? I know this is everybody's kind of an unknown right now, but um, what are your thoughts on that? And, and how should an applicant prepare um, to interview with you this year? You know, like in years past, you know, doing this for whatever, eight, nine years now, I feel like one of the biggest things I've tried to mentor students is, you know, just go with, go with your gut, right? It's that kind of, it's kind of that easy catch all thing that, that people like me say that, that it's going to be incredibly hard. To, to really feel this year, to get that feel of a program. So I feel like that might be one of the harder things from these um, virtual sessions, but I feel like it's that unknown part that maybe has me a wee bit anxious about that, but ultimately I think it's gonna be okay. I think once we go through it once or twice, you know, and our Loyola EM students will be the first people to feel that with us and we'll, we'll work through that first session together. And then I'm sure afterwards we'll be like, you know that, that was, that was kind of enjoyable. I might say that. I don't know if they will, but I might say that, you know, so it's, and then ultimately that will become the norm. I think one of the beauties of, of EM is, you know, you just adapt, right? That's, that's it. It's like we, we deal the, the, the hand that we're dealt. So it's, it's not going to be the same. We're all going to have these probably super awkward socials the night before where we're trying, the residents are trying to get to know each other. And it's going to be, it's just going to take one person to go all in on that and let their guard down. And then it will be completely back to normal, I feel like, because everyone's going to understand that they need to get from it what they can. And, and it's probably going to lead to more 
questions than is probably the, the, the pre-interview dinners have, or socials have had in the past. But, you know, it's the residents, going back to one of those first questions, the residents are, are going to be so crucial in this process because, you know, like if you listen to a PD talk, I feel like it's always, are they selling this to me? But with the residents, it's, it's that safety net. You know, it's like if I ask them something, they're going to give me a real answer, which for anyone listening is exactly how it is for the PDs too. We are being as honest as we possibly can in this, which is 100%, you know? So yeah, it's going to be awkward, no doubt. There are going to be people talking over themselves. I'll say stuff when I'm on mute. The same thing will happen. People's internet connections are going to die. Kids are going to come screaming in. It's going to be, it's just, but it's all going to be okay. And we'll, we'll ultimately, at the end of the day, all be in that same place of, of like, we worked through this and it, and it worked out just fine. Yeah, I think the key is going to be really open communication. We've talked about um, what we're going to do if Zoom starts failing or if internet connection and something goes bad. And I'm, I'm going to say, just call me on my cell phone. Like, it, it, these aren't things that should defeat your application. Uh, same with, with the way that we're going to get you exposed to our residents. We, we don't know quite yet, but it's probably going to be having a couple of them in a room and just chatting with, with you all the same way that we're doing right now. Um, the most difficult part about this on our side is trying to advertise ourselves to, you know, if I say I'm going to bring in three residents into this room and you can ask them anything you want, how am I going to tell all, this, all you students that you can call in and ask them questions? Um, we're, we're having the same kind of issues with, with um, marketing ourselves as you all are having with marketing yourselves. And um, it doesn't really help, and maybe I'm, I'm giving away too much information here, but it doesn't help when all of our, uh, when all of our institutions are losing money and hemorrhaging cash because of COVID, and then you want to go to your chair or to a dean and say, I need a little more money for, for marketing and for making a nice video. And, and they're like, no, we're, we're not going to do that. So we're going to do our best, but most of it's going to have to be grassroots and organic. And I, I will say that I, I think that you as a group have done better than any other class in history in terms of getting on Twitter, getting on these Zoom calls, advocating for yourselves, uh, being involved in AAEM, all these things. And that helps for sure. Which just tells me that they're going to be good emergency physicians, right? They are, you have been remarkably adaptive to everything that has been thrown at you. And it is a, it's a huge heavy lift um, for all of us. And it's a, it's a learning curve. We'll get through this together. I will say, um, from your side, um, just as we are learning how to do, you know, video conferencing and Zoom calls, and what it, what's your presence like um, via video? Um, do you come across um, as professional um, as yourself? Are you pretty laid back? Are you pretty comfortable in this type of environment? With sort of, well, you'll be uh, interviewed via video you might want to sort of practice, um, get some feedback about how you come across um, on a screen, because this, this will be the interview season for you. And you might want to get some feedback about your presentation skills um, or how well you interview, because this is, again, it's new for all of us. You won't have that face-to-face -face, um, interaction, and, and it will just change the dynamic of the interview. So go ahead and practice. We're gonna, we plan to do that with our students. Um, here so that, that you're, you're polished for your interview. And it, that will just um, go that much farther during your interview season. Dr. Corey and Dr. Snow kind of touched on this with um, the, uh, you know, the resident dinner and, and uh, those other events that are uh, in the typical year designed to get the applicant a feel for the culture and ask those questions that you would, you know, not necessarily want to ask the program director during an interview. Um, is there anything in particular that y'all are planning as sort of virtual adaptations to this concept? Um, do you know yet? I'm going to ask my chief residents because they're very smart and very good at the social media stuff. And they're not as like stodgy as I am with this. Cause um, I like to think I'm good at what I do, but in terms of um, technology innovation, I, I, I definitely don't hold a candle to most of these residents. So I, the way I'm going to handle it is ask them what they would want in the situation. They, and hopefully they'll say, oh, you should do this or you should do that. Um, I've been talking to other PDs at our institution at UAB, whether it's o, the OB program director or anesthesia or surgery. 
and getting some ideas. And what I have found so far is that we're all kind of our f feeling our way in the dark and hopefully we all get our stuff together in July or August. Um, but uh, we're, I, we're gonna do whatever we think students respond best to. Um, because I know that some folks, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going on Snapchat and doing like a live feed or anything, but I'll, I'll do the best I can, uh, to keep up with the, with kids these days. Yeah, we're doing the same thing. We have a, a recruitment meeting scheduled for the end of July with any interest, re, interested resident that actually wants to be part of this. And our incoming interns have all kinds of ideas because they're all over social media. And I mean, if you follow me on social media, it's like my kid and my dog, right? I don't really know how to do anything. So um, and, and again, we're going to listen to them and, and say, hey, what you guys went through this process last year or the year before or the year before that, like what, how do we show who we are, right? Because that's, that is really important too, guys. You have to remember, this is like a two-way match, right? So we look at people we think would be, hey, this person would be really interesting to meet, maybe to train, that'd be awesome. But you guys are also looking at like, where do I want to spend the next three to four years of my life? What program is going to help me to get to the next step in wherever I want to go with my career? And every place is different. And so like we were, are trying to show you who we are, what we can offer, we're trying to learn about you. So it's a two-way street here. It's not just, you guys have far more power than you actually realize in this process. Um, and so we're still sorting it out. How do we show our character and our culture without our traditional ways of doing so? So I don't know. I think most places, my guess is that the way you guys will get information on what programs are going to be doing or not doing is probably via their website. So you know, and I don't think anyone's ready. So I would say like, give us the summer to work this out. And then hopefully we'll have some, some um, ideas up for you guys to figure out how you can learn more about us or interact during our interview days. Yeah. And as students, if you guys have any great ideas, pop them in that chat. Um, we are open um, to ideas. Um, and what, what do you all want um, as from the student perspective? as we're trying to develop this interview season. What do you want? What, what would you like to see from the programs? And just pop that in the chat um, and we'll take that under advisement. Yeah, I think if, it's, if you're a residency program and you have all of this figured out and all the videos done, I think that's a huge red flag for applicants because I wonder what they've been doing onboarding the residents and graduating their graduating class. I'm kidding, of course. I'm just trying to give a nod to the fact that really none of us have this, this piece figured out, but we're actively working on it. Yeah, I know. Again, I can say uh, that the the opportunities that I've had to participate in didactics or sim through the Navy residencies via Zoom, um, anything like that, I know it's been hugely beneficial just seeing how they educate their residents and seeing the kind of conversations and interactions that they have and um, how the residents interact with one another. I feel like you can kind of only keep up a facade for so long, you know, if you're in the middle of a sim and things aren't going well. Um, you kind of see the true colors come out. So I know that that, you know, that if that's a possibility, I know it's very helpful. Um, the changes that are being made this year, um, do you all foresee that changing the future uh, for you and how you uh, conduct application season? Or um, is this going to be kind of just keep your head down, get through this year and, and back to normal next year? It, full disclosure, I hope that this is a one-off thing. I miss people. I miss looking at folks in the eye. Um, I miss the, uh, the, the interaction, the one-on-one. -on -one. And, I, and I think that we get to know more about you and you get to know more about us. I mean, I would like you to see our emergency department even. That, that's the part, that's the scariest part about all this to me. It's not even getting to know you or you getting to know me. It's that you should probably see where you're going to work for the next three to four years. Um, and hopefully things will go back to a, a new normal. Um, I don't expect things to be exactly the same and I don't expect us to go back to exactly the way that we were doing things. Uh, I think I'm going to utilize zoom more for sure, but I would really like to go back to a place where, uh, you get to come and see the, the program and meet the residents in person and have dinner with us. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think there's, I mean, we're obviously in the Midwest. We recruit from all over the country. Some people come here and the first time they've ever been to Chicago is on their interview day, right? So um, they're like, oh, I actually like it here. And so I think that that in-person aspect and having, you know, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen this year. I think people may tend to stay a little closer to home or to places that they know better just because it's hard to move somewhere having never been somewhere before, right? Um, 
but I th I'm hoping this is a one-off year. I think I'm also hoping that we learn things from this year that are actually better for our interview process that we can incorporate going forward. Um, but I hope that we still have the opportunity going forward to have in-person interviews. Uh, I, I like that connection. You guys really get to see what we're about. We can see what you're about and you get to check out somewhere new that maybe you might want to be. Yeah. Third vote for going back to in-person uh, interviews. There's, there really is only one way to sort of get the feel, um, not only the residency program, but the city, um, what it has to offer. And that's just to um, come and see it for yourself. Um, I do hope that we come out of this um, with maybe better personal statements, um, as well as um, better letters of recommendation uh, as we take a, a good look at it this year, maybe for uh, keeping that going um, to get more quality within the application itself uh, going forward would be a good thing to, to keep um, from this um, year going forward. Yeah, and you know, like the, all the work going into the websites is not going to be for nothing. You know, ultimately, you know, it doesn't change the amount of time that needs to be invested by a potential applicant to look through all of those different websites and all of the pages of information that are within that. But surely that has to be a positive for applicants in, in years to come too. Um, I agree with, with everything else that, that's been said, though. I, I hope that the virtual part is, is a one-off this year. If you had to, uh, if you had to choose a, a single piece of advice, um, not to put you in a corner, but uh, one thing to uh, give to a, an applicant this year, what what would that be? I, d I don't I don't know if it's really changed out of what, which might be a ridiculous thing to ultimately come to my, that conclusion. But I mean, it's the way like the interview still becomes like the most important part, right? And we've talked about the approaches for for the application and all of that. But still on the interview, I feel like if you really make an attempt to connect with those people, and I have to get rid of my face on the screen because otherwise I, I look right at my face. I know what my weaknesses are with this video chat. And I guess staring at myself is one of them, which, you know, if that's not a red flag. I don't know what is. But, but that what was said earlier um, of, I think it was Dr. Platt that said it, of, of videoing yourself in, in this format, answering questions is, is going to be a really good thing to do because your ability to, to just step outside of the incredibly awkward and, you know, non-personal aspect of these interactions and really put across who you are and what motivates you and what your passions are. And for the person on the other end to feel that is not easy to do. And no one should ever become someone that they're not. We're not saying that at all. If you're quiet and reserved you're quiet and reserved and own that you know what i mean like you don't have to you don't have to come in with 12 cups of coffee in your system and just go for it you know and do 100 words a minute but you know just practice practice asking some of the the questions that we all ask probably on every interview about why you am you know all the standard stuff and like answer it in such a way that all of the weaknesses the lighting the camera height the background all of those things are negated um, and that you as a person shines through in this that if you if you just do your homework in that and have someone review it and just say here you need to tell me exactly what was wrong with this video and I'll love you forever you know and if they give you all positive things say I'll give you another chance at that now and I want to hear something that I can do better with this next time that's going to be and we, we did that with our students um, just in the past couple of months past few weeks honestly and it was immensely helpful I felt like because people figured out because I lift my hands awkwardly at times too so I figured that out about myself as well so that would be my one piece of advice succinctly said in 500 words I guess my advice would be in it's easier said than done take a deep breath right so we're all in this together um we're all learning right I mean we don't I if I tried to predict what we're going to do totally every detail of interview season right now, I guarantee you it would be like 180 degrees from what we're actually going to do. So we're all still trying to figure this out. Um, we're doing the best we can to give you guys the best advice we can. And it's going to be kind of a strange year, but I honestly believe that in March, you guys will all open up those envelopes and everyone will be very happy. And that's the end goal here. Right. And so, um, we will do our best to get you guys through this. We'll do our best to be as transparent as we can and as a community, not just the four of us. And, um, you know, trust in yourselves, believe in yourselves. You guys are really outstanding people, right? And are going to be outstanding physicians. And it'd be an honor to have 
any of you in our program, right? We just have to figure out how to go through this volume and, and get there. So, so trust yourselves, be proud of yourselves for all of your achievements thus far and write your application to highlight who you are. Cause that's what we really want to know. We want to know who you are and can we help you get to where you want to go with your career and will you enjoy your time in our program? I agree. Let your light shine. This, um, this is really about you. Um, highlight what you're accomplished, what you're proud of, what makes you, you highlight that. Let us know that, be proud of it. Um, and let us know who you are, what makes you um, the emergent, best emergency physician that you can be and um, sell that. This, this is um, what it's all about. You have sort of that one chance um, and, and let's make it the best that it can be. Don't sort of hide in the corner and expect it to sort of jump off the page on the ARIS application. You need to um, show us who you are um, and really highlight um, all your strengths. Um, my advice would be when, when you're on rotations, uh, I, I like it when, when students ask for advice and not ask for feedback. And the reason is not because I think what I say is important, but it's because it catches me off guard a little bit. And I can at least tell you what I value, what I think is important. And as you ask more people for advice, uh, they'll be more honest with you than if you ask for feedback, I think. And then, you know, the other side of that is when somebody t gives you advice, when somebody gives you the, you know, the, I think you should use it. If somebody tells you that your personal statement comes off this way or that way, don't just put it in the back of your head and say, that's just this one person. Um, this, is, this year is probably the most important time to take people's feedback into account and to really think about it, just like your video presence or your or personal statement or what electives you're going to, you're going to take, what your OSLO looks like. Um, just uh, assume that when people give you advice, it comes from a good place and try to incorporate those things into your practice. Thank you all for that. I definitely appreciate that. And we all appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to be here. Um, we had a, a couple questions in the Q and A that I wanted to read and then I'd like to uh, hear a little bit about uh, y'all's programs before we, we head out, if that's okay. If y'all are not running out the door yet. So um, the first one was, uh, what would you think of non-clinical letters from medical school faculty? Uh, for example, those who worked with us closely and can comment on leadership and interpersonal skills uh, without being able to comment on uh, our clinical skills. Great. Um, cause you'll, you know, you'll have that East slow, um, that will actually, um, highlight some of your clinical capabilities from emergency medicine. Just it's more information is, and that leadership is, is another part of your application. So highlight that. Yes. I agree. Honestly. Um, you know, it's as long as there's, there's something in the file that speaks to the clinical aspect, then great. Right. I mean, it, it sounds like the person that, that you're saying, um, that hasn't worked with you clinically, has a lot to say about you, fantastic. It, it fits along with the themes that we've said so far. Yeah, and I think, uh, I think you'll address that uh, in, in spirit pretty well earlier. Um, the, the last one was uh, with the shorter interview season, um, will not having the standard, the one standard slow ready by uh, 21 October be uh, more deleterious than in previous years? I feel like I feel like the the question or the statement is more that we as program directors need to make sure that we don't apply the same rules as in previous years, which I don't think any of us will, you know, given given how we've talked about it. So, you know, it's like I said earlier too, it's like I feel in years past for sure, if you didn't have a slow, that was deleterious, right? I mean that that was not a good thing in the far because it's the most important thing. But I think that, you know, you know, it's it's going to be okay this year to 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 come in with a late slow because in years past, where you know once you guys open, there's this you know influx of data towards residency leadership, but then after the fact, there's a lot of you know this has been updated. I have another letter. I have another letter. Step two's in there. I have another letter. Times you know thirteen, fifteen hundred, whatever your number of applications are, and I and I feel like in years past that probably. That was superbly hard to get through. And, and this year, that all hands on deck that we've talked about, some of those hands are going to be involved in making sure that we are staying up with these things that are coming in late because 
because the third slow on top of two with an otherwise complete file maybe wouldn't have added much, but that first slow on top of zero is massive, you know, like that, that's a big thing. So, so deleterious, no, it's just gonna, it's gonna be more work on your part to, to you know, let programs know through the, through the, the standard channels. And we as PDs know that we have to, to be more receptive to these communications after EGRAS opens. I agree. Yeah, I think we, you're going to find this interview season a lot more forgiving um, than it has been um, in the past. So don't sort of stress about that if, if you have one that's coming late. But, it, you know, in the end, you, you will have to um, keep us informed when it does get uploaded. But we are you're going to um, have a lot of leeway um, and a lot of forgiveness this interview season. Um, that, that actually got me thinking of a point. Uh, I wouldn't overly rely on someone's video production value or the way that they a program presents themselves online necessarily because it's, it, you know, especially with a younger program, a newer program, programs that don't have the money of, of private institutions, um, it's really important to get to know the residents, find ways, email them, cold email, ask their chiefs, find them on Twitter, do something and learn about programs that way. And don't just be wowed by, um, by a cool video because that, and that, because I'm the kind of person who is wowed by cool videos. So I feel like I'm giving that advice to myself. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And, uh, I, I know in my experience working with uh, residents in the past, uh, most, people would be pretty receptive to somebody reaching out, you know, uh, as long as you're respectful of time, et cetera. Um, I would like to point out that everybody watching should not try to emulate my lighting situation for their interviews. <laughs> I've been messing with it to try to make it work, but it doesn't. Um, so I would like to, uh, I'd like to give you all the chance uh, to tell us a little bit about your program, uh, what you love about it and um, why an applicant should check y'all out. What I love about our program, I, I would say it's the uh, camaraderie of our residents. We make a really big deal about having camaraderie, well, even if you're from different backgrounds, different walks of life, different medical schools, all those things. Our residents really click together and it's important uh, for them to uh, get to know one another and to be there for one another. And um, I am especially proud of our trauma experience, especially over the past few years. Uh, we've really transformed our product for emergency medicine residents, and I've become more and more proud of that each year to where if you, um, I think you could put our program up against anyone in the country trauma experience wise for emergency medicine residents because we're, we're in a city with a lot of, unfortunately, with a lot of violence um, and uh, a lot of uh, MVCs around the area. And um, But the bright side of that from an emergency medicine training is you get really outstanding experience. So I would put our trauma experience up with anyone in the country. Yeah, so um, U Chicago, uh, one of the oldest programs in the country, we're a three-year program, so you guys are gonna you know, get that whole three versus four-year question. Uh, find the right program for you, that's my advice on that. Um, we um, purposely recruit people from all over the country with different backgrounds, um, having a diverse training program with people that have different lifestyles, different interests, different backgrounds, different future directions from you is something that's a core principle of our program and something we take very seriously. Um, we are an academic institution, um, but, and so we have all kinds of the, like complex LVAD patients and transplant patients and, and things like that, but our community catchment area is predominantly an underserved area on the south side of Chicago. Um, so you have to think about healthcare disparities on a daily basis with the work that we do to make sure we can provide our patients the highest quality of care. Uh, we also have a freestanding children's hospital on site that offers the same patient population and then an affiliate community hospital. Uh, speaking of trauma, um, we're the busiest trauma center in Chicago and um, Chicago has uh, quite a bit of um, unfortunate gun violence. So not only do we take care of those patients, but we actively work on sort of social EM causes and research projects to try to figure out how, do we, how we can um, fix some of these things going forward. Um, part of our thing is we want to trade leaders in emergency medicine. So if you interview, I will ask you what your leadership potential is. And that um, doesn't mean you need to be an academic chair someday, right? You can be a leader in whatever discipline it is that is interesting to you. That could be academic medicine, that could be a community leader, that could be global work, that could be out of medicine completely, starting your own company or working in policy, whatever, right? Whatever it is that, that's your jam, it's our job to get you to where you want to go. So um, we have a lot of fun too. Um, I love our shop. It's
Pittsburgh. And I will take up that challenge for Charles about the best uh, trauma training. Um, I'll take that challenge. The University of Louisville, we are a three-year program. We will take 12 um, each year. And uh, again, level one academic uh, trauma facility. We have our own uh, PEDS independent hospital as well, which is also a level one uh, pediatric trauma hospital. Uh, but I will tell you, uh, my favorite number is 1,095. That is the amount of days that I have to train you to be an emergency physician. Every single um, day that I have you, I will challenge you. I will work you hard. But the product to become the best emergency physician that you can be in that short time frame is what you can get guaranteed at at the University of Louisville. Um, we really um, want you. We're resident run. Um, we are an autonomous program. You guys, we really will stretch you, um, challenge you, develop you um, to make you the best emergency physician that you can be. Yeah, I feel, like, I feel like the best thing for me from this past interview cycle was actually having residents because it, it wasn't just me, you know, selling a car essentially, which is what I can sound like I'm doing sometimes. I have no problem with people to sell cars. It's just, you know, to have residents to back up some statements is, is a really key thing you know we are we are in our coming up for our third year of recruitment so if you want me as your chief then then that should be another red flag to, to put in there so we are we are closely affiliated with with stretch it's it's right there it's not open to us right now um because of this this bloody pandemic but um our residents the key thing I try and stress to, to the applicants coming through is, is if, you, if you want to leave your mark on, on a residency program, then come to this program and help me build together. And I say that with the full knowledge that there's not really anything for you to build because we've built the program based on the incredible resources that Loyola has. It shows a very similar patient population, I feel like, to, to what Dr. Babcock has at, at UFC in terms of its quaternary care and then and then this community and need that exists around Loyola. But then within that, along, along with that too, is that, is that social EM need that exists within our communities. Um, and then there's also the, the uh, education aspect that exists with our College of Medicine. So you're gonna come in expecting um, from, from me and, and our program to teach our medical students, to teach your residents. It's going to be part of a required curriculum that's going to be built over the three years. Um, I think what's, what's been really unique for me to work through is I've tried to be protective of my residents, you know, and they're now entering the, the second year. And, and now I'm, I'm being told by, by them that, that they want to get more involved with certain things and recruitment, certain things in education, planning for conference scheduling um, which I'm hoping is not just them saying that the schedule I put together is is not good but I think it's more of that they have their eye on operations and, and residency leadership and, and and medical student education and that's all part of the things that I spoke to them about on on recruitment days if you wanted to come and help push this place forward every year then you're gonna have a set of faculty that are diverse that have been trying to get a residency program with Dr. C. Sean for 15, 20 years um, and that are going to rally around you and, and mentor you. So it's that whole milieu together and amongst this incredible um, care institution that, that makes our, our program what it is. Well, thank you all. Uh, Y'all are obviously all uh, invested in, in care, uh, care about your residents and the people applying. And I think anybody would be uh, fortunate to train with uh, any one of you. Um, and I can't, Thank you enough for taking the time uh, to uh, talk with us and give us your insight um, and wisdom. Um, is there anything, any parting words other than that, any ideas or anything that anyone has? Thanks, thank for, thanks for hosting us. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> thank you. Stay in touch. I've saved the chat because there's a lot of really good points in there for, for anyone else who wants to do that. Um, but thank you all. Thanks guys. Good luck. It's going to be great. We hope you have enjoyed this podcast brought to you by the American Academy of Emergency Medicine Resident and Student Association. For more information about AEM RSA, visit the website at www.aaemrsa.org.
Listen to all podcasts in this series and explore the ways you can get involved with RSA. Join us again next episode for another topic of importance for emergency medicine residents and students.